the International Anthony Burgess Foundation podcast, the music of Anthony Burgess. In this episode, the Burgess Foundation's Will Carr speaks to Christine Lee Gengaro, who has recently published her edition of Burgess's This Man and Music. Christine has taught in the music department at Los Angeles City College for 16 years. She has published two books, listening to Stanley Kubrick, the music in his films, and experiencing Chopin. Her work has also appeared in the books The Encyclopedia of Hip Hop and The Worlds of Back to the Future. This Man and Music is part of the Irwell edition of the works of Anthony Burgess, which is published by Manchester University Press. The Irwell edition aims to reassess Burgess's novels and non-fiction, presenting each text with a new introduction, extensive annotations, and previously unpublished appendices from the Burgess archives around the world. The first six volumes of the Irwell edition are available now from your favourite place to buy books. Hi, Christine. Welcome Hi. to the podcast. Hi. Thank you very much. Uh, and well, thanks for joining us. And uh, congratulations on your new edition of This Man of Music, which I've been enjoying very much. Thank uh, you I'll very much. It looks, looks magnificent. I w- wonder if you could, um, well, I thought maybe we could begin if, by you telling us a bit about what sort of a book it is and uh, what, what you made of it and what you thought Burgess was setting out to do when. All right. Well, it is a very interesting uh, book. It's sort of a couple of different things. And it began life as a series of lectures that Burgess gave at um, uh, a university. And uh, that same year, which was 1980, he actually gave four other lectures uh, at a college in the United States. And both sets of lectures dealt with music and literature as their sort of central topic. And the first set uh, of lectures was supposed to be published. Uh, it was for the um, Elliott Memorial Lectures, uh, the University of Kent. And they were going to publish this set of lectures. But by the time he had finished the second set of lectures, Burgess decided to turn the whole thing into a book. So instead of just four lectures, it ended up being 11 chapters. It kind of went, took that as a departure point, kind of went off from there. So it ended up being more, I would describe it more as a series of essays about music, about composition, about music and literature. So it's a bit, um, it's, I think it's sort of lacks the cohesion of, let's just say, a regular memoir or of a, uh, a book of lectures that, that are organized around a central theme. It, it does sort of go off in different directions. So it ends up being this funny little book uh, that has elements of memoir and elements of this lecture series and also um, an exegesis on um, MF and one on a Napoleon symphony. So it does it does go off in these odd directions, and it's sort of a weird catch-all for a bunch of ideas that Burgess had that all end up in this one book together. Um, so I came to it when I was writing my dissertation back in the early 2000s on A Clockwork Orange because it's full of a lot of great Burgessian sound bites about music. Um, but when I read the entire thing uh, later on, and certainly when I got into it doing this editing process, uh, you really discover such an interesting um, collection of ideas in it. It's a very strange little book. There, there is a great deal in there, isn't there? And as you say, it covers an enormous variety of topics. Um, but it, it begins quite conventionally in a way, I think, with a, a chapter called Biographica Musicalis, which is a kind of memoir chapter. Is that right? Yes. And so Burgess is, um, uh, he's, well, in the 1980s, Burgess is perhaps starting to think about his own autobiography, I suppose, and he, which culminates in the first volume of his memoirs, Little Wilson and Big God. And I wonder if this book is, is part of that process. I wonder if you could tell us a bit more about Burgess's own musical history and what it meant to him. Well, you know, that's an excellent point. The, you know, the early 80s, this was definitely a time where he's thinking about um, his musical career, as it were, and uh, his legacy 
in music. And so he's thinking about the, uh, the, the self-teaching process. And so we hear, uh, he talks about it in The Piano Players, you know, it, it sort of fictionalizes the account. He talks about it in Little Wilson, and he talks about it in This Man in Music, this idea of his father perhaps showing him the middle C on the keyboard. Of course, in, in one of these versions, the, his father doesn't show him where middle C is. Um, but uh, we get this sort of, uh, I think it's a, an account of the way that he starts teaching himself music. And we see it in uh, This Man in Music, and we see it in Little Wilson, and then we see a fictionalized account of it in The Piano Players, all sort of happening in the late 70s, early 80s. Um, and I think he's really thinking about that in this man in music that in that chapter, he goes through all of the, I would say the the benchmarks of his early coming to music, learning about it, um, becoming to love it, listening to it on the radio, reading scores, taking scores out of the library, going to concerts at the Halle Orchestra, um, all of these aspects of the way that he learned about music and really I think absorbed a lot of musical um, practices that were common in the late romantic period. I mean, this is what his voice ends up sounding like. It ends up sounding like a um, late 19th century uh, romanticism with some, you know, some Holst and some Vaughn Williams thrown in there uh, and a little bit of Debussy. And I think it's important for him at this point in his life to start talking about this and writing it down. And I think, and this is sort of my own reading of it, this idea of legitimizing himself, of saying, I am a composer, here's my history. It may not be perfect because this is where it comes from, but it's authentically me, I think is, I, is kind of the, the way that I read it and see it in all of these different versions is this um, way of saying, here's what I was dealing with, and here's the choices that I made. That's, right. That's really interesting. And one of the senses that I get from these various iterations of the story, I suppose, is that Burgess is hugely proud of his musical history. You know, he's proud of his father's background in the cinema and in the pub, and he's proud of his own kind of autodidacticism about it. Um, do, do you get that sense of, of it from this man in music? Oh, yes, absolutely. There is a there's a sense of uh, rugged individualism of of figuring it out. I mean, you know, we as a person who has spent years in music school myself, you know, and, and even up to the doctoral level, um, you know, I've dedicated many years of my education to music. And for him to sort of be able to do it without that, I think, was a source of pride and shame at different points in his life. And I think as he got older, the shame aspect of it started to go away. And the pride aspect of it was, I think, much greater because he thought to himself, perhaps, um, wow, I can really do this. I can actually, I can actually put notes on a page and then they sound like something and it's, it's not terrible. Um, so I definitely think there's, there's a, that sort of pride to that. Uh, I taught myself how to do this. Um, and also, you know, <laughs> I mean, I think as, as a, you know, as we all get older, I think there's that sense of, well, I am what I am, you know, and, and I don't have to apologize for it. And in fact, I can find my own journey was something to be proud of. And I, I think he, I think he's in that, that mindset when he writes this and when he writes Little Wilson and when he writes um, uh, The Piano Players. And one of the pieces he's most proud of, I think, is his own symphony in C, which he talks about at length in This Man in Music, there's a whole chapter called Let's Write a Symphony. Um, it's a very unusual chapter in a way because he attempts to articulate his his creative process in quite a lot of detail. Um, I wonder if you could just tell us a bit about that. How did, how did Burgess himself write his music and how do you think his approach was distinctive? Well, you know, what's so interesting about, about that is that he, you know, he lays it out. It's a very practical thing. It's a very practical process. You know, he, he says, I want it to be sort of in this idiom, I'm going to make this part 40 measures long and this part 
500 measures long. I mean, he thinks about it in terms of the structure. And, um, and of course he even says like, well, that, you know, this sounds a little heartless. This sounds, you know, you know, not, you, you think music just comes from the passions, you know, but, but this, I mean, we, you know, anyone who studies music seriously knows that's not true. You know, that Mozart and Haydn and especially early Beethoven, they're writing in formulas. And of course, songs are written in formulas as well. And I think Burgess is latching on to that when he starts out, but you know, to say, is this process distinctive from other composers? Well, other composers haven't gone into this level of detail, you know, and I think one of the things that Burgess says at the beginning of the chapter is you don't know how people do this. Composition is, is almost like magic and the magician is reluctant to tell you how the trick is done. So he, you know, he sets out in that chapter to say, I'm going to, I'm going to show you everything. I'm going to take you backstage. I'm going to show you how this was all put together. And, um, and it doesn't, I I think for people who maybe don't know a lot about music in a formal sense, you know, maybe they just love to listen to it. I've never thought about it in terms of these structural points, but to have Burgess kind of lay that all bare, I think is actually kind of a wonderful thing that he does is uh, kind of show you, Hey, it's not magic. This is how I did it, and um, it's interesting. We, we there's a um, the it, one of the appendices in the book is the program note um, uh, that he wrote. Um, and uh, let's see, we have the program note for the first performance of the symphony in C, uh, which is one of the appendices. And another of the appendices is how I wrote my third symphony, which is an article I think he wrote for the Times. So um, this idea of revisiting this piece of music over and over again as the biggest piece of music that he was responsible for and all the things that went into it. I think for him, and certainly he says this, the premiere of it in Iowa was one of the greatest artistic moments of his life. This is a person who at that point had written, you know, almost three dozen books and yet hearing this a symphony uh, performed by, you know, these, these uh, university students was this transcendent, beautiful moment for him of culmination, something he'd always wanted, but had never had the opportunity to have. So I think that chapter is a must read for anyone who is a composer, but also anyone who's really interested in, in doing that. I suspect other composers have a practical process, at least in part, and um, that Burgess is the only one willing to sort of lay that bare the way that he does. Absolutely. But at the same time, though, his his novels are full of music and musicians, and he and a big part of this man of music is him reflecting, I think, on the, um, the relationships, I suppose, between his writing of music and his writing of literature. And there's uh, quite a detailed discussion of Gerard Manley Hopkins. There's also a lot of Joyce in This Man in Music. And I, I wondered if you could just speak a little bit about what Burgess says about the relationships between music and literature. It's my understanding that that was the original title of one of the lecture series, I think. It was a, an attempt to, to bring these sister arts together. Perhaps. It's it's very interesting that you say that because, you know, it is it was supposed to be the central issue of the book and he doesn't even get to asking the question until about chapter five and you know 
you would imagine that a book that was supposed to address this issue would would start at the very beginning, but he kind of works his way towards that. And um, and of course, one of the things that he does is he, he spends an entire chapter talking about Gerard Manley Hopkins, and he spends an entire chapter talking about James Joyce. For Burgess, uh, Joyce and Hopkins exemplified music in writing, music in words. And for them, it was the sounds of the words themselves. Um, you know, for Hopkins, of course, it was the way that the lines scanned. It was the accents and the non-accented meters. Um, and for to to for Burgess, they really brought home how musical words could be. And I think in these chapters, he delves into specific examples of the way music crept into their writing. And then I think as the chapters go on, he talks about the way that music not just crept, but you know, walked confidently into his writing. And I think the the structures that he uses as a novelist and the characters that are composers or musicians or music lovers, I think those are so important. They, you know, from the very first novel to the very last, you have musician and composer characters who are struggling against the, you know, a cruel, you know, musicless world. And these are the characters that we root for. You know, we root for the musician, we root for the music lover, we root for the composer in these um, in these books because they are the ones that are that are having a rough time that are that are we're engaged with their struggle. So I think that's a uh, it's very telling that all of these characters end up being the most sympathetic characters and the people who are trying to keep them down are the antagonists, right? The people who are trying to keep them from their goals uh, are these non-musical people who don't understand, don't understand music and don't understand passion and love and art and all that good stuff. Uh, and and you mentioned also that one of the other ways in which music marches into Burgess's novels is in the structure. And this man in music spends quite a lot of time on that, I think. There's a whole chapter on Napoleon Symphony, which is based on Beethoven's Third Symphony. Um, I w- wonder if you could just t- tell us a bit more about that and you know how Burgess sort of defends his artistic choices and, and whether you think it works. Well, that's it. You know, Napoleon Symphony is such an interesting idea. What a, what a, what a fascinating idea. So we, let's just, you know, rewind a second to talk about Clockwork Orange, which is, you know, is you know, ob- arguably the most famous novel. But also in a three, well, it's in a three-part structure that Burgess kind of likened to a sonata form, which is the standard formula for symphony first movements, right? It's got two contrasting ideas, um, and then there's a, they're, they're exposed in the first section. There's a development section where the themes are put into a blender and sort of developed in a lot of different ways. And then you have a final third where the first themes come back but they're a little bit different and you can see this in the way clockwork orange is structured right the first part and the third part start the same way with the same words um, but have a sort of different ending um, and go a different way and he talks about this sort of sonata form idea in that book and that was sort of way back uh you know in the in the early 60s and then you have the, um, and then you have the uh, Napoleon Symphony, which is from a bit later, and this idea of taking not just the sonata form, but taking an entire four movement symphony, which has its own extra musical reference um, as the structure for a novel, and it's kind of a strange fit. It, it, I don't, on the face of it, it doesn't seem like it's such a great idea because Napoleon, there's a, there's a funeral march in the second movement. <laughs> you know, so what do you, how do you do that? If our hero dies in the second movement, how does he then come back for the third and fourth movement? Um, so there are a lot of, I think, logistical issues that go along with it. Um, now, one of the chapters 
in This Man in Music is actually a sort of great explanation of what everything means. And if you are interested in reading this book, I would highly recommend that you read the chapter uh, in This Man in Music that corresponds with it because I think it will really reveal exactly what what the process was there. And certainly you can appreciate it without that at a certain level. But I think it I think it's the type of book that really benefits from having what I would call an uh, analogous to like a program note, right? If you go to a if you go to a concert and you read the program notes, you, the, you it tells you what to listen for. It tells you what's going to happen and it kind of reveals the structure to you and maybe the context and the history and well novels don't get program notes. <laughs> so so it was I think a very interesting idea well, it, it certainly helped me, you know, the introduction and the, the annotations helped me and my understanding of the book, but, and also putting it in the con- wider context of Burgess's writing in the 80s and also his, his longer musical and novelistic career. Um, what we haven't really talked about, actually, is Burgess's music itself. I mean, we mentioned the symphony, but he mm-hmm. wrote music of all kinds for, for decades um, very little of which was heard in his lifetime. I wondered what you thought of Burgess's music itself and, and what you thought its reputation was likely to be. You know, it's very interesting to to think about, you know, when I started to write my dissertation, which was on A Clockwork Orange, this is, as I said, it was the early 2000s, and there was a production of the uh, play, the musical play uh, to A Clockwork Orange. And um, the that was sort of the first time that I had ever heard anything that Burgess had written uh, that was music, and it was very it was a very interesting uh, experience because I had I had no idea, and this was sort of the sort of opened the door. Um, and when we uh, when I was there in 2017, when I was in Manchester in 2017, we heard a performance of the symphony in C. And of course, I've heard other things uh, at conferences there. There's been chamber works, there's been vocal works. And um, in general, I would say that, you know, the smaller the group uh, of players, I think the more successful Burgess was at writing. I think the symphony is an enormous work. And he wrote it, you know, by his own admission, sort of wrote it in hotel rooms with no piano as reference. And um, a lot of this was just done out of his head, which is incredible. And um, a pretty, uh, no mean feat. Um, But also, he did not have the he didn't have the back and forth that one would have with a composition teacher or a mentor, someone who would say, I think that bit's a bit a, a bit long, or maybe you want to develop this part a little bit more. Um, and he, without that sort of back and forth, I think it what ends what you end up getting is a product that's a little bigger than it should be, a little maybe maybe flabbier than it should be. It could be cut a little bit, and it could be sort of cleaned up. Um, but what I think you end up with is sort of an incredible feat. Uh, I am a musician and I could not write a symphony. That's not within my desire to do, but also I, gosh, I would, I think I would give up, you know, halfway through, it would just be such a Herculean task. But as we talked about, I think his passion was in the process of it. So I think it was this sort of labor of love. Um, so I think it's successful in the fact that it sounds it sounds pretty good, and um, there's some beautiful stuff in it, some beautiful melodies in it. I don't. I think he did have a beautiful. Uh, he had a great aptitude for melody, um, but I think the things that I feel were um, more successful are the chamber works. You know, the things that I've I've heard performed, and uh, I think it was maybe two years ago, um, I reviewed the. Um, New recording, Stefan Ginsberg's uh, recording of the, you know, the bad tempered keyboard. So the 24 preludes and fugues in the style of, of, um, you know, sort of after Bach and Shostakovich.
And um, I think that's a, the, my favorite thing that he wrote. It's so clever and so beautifully done. And there is not an extraneous note in the entire piece. Um, and I think because it's for piano, which was his, um, his comfort place as a musician, um, I think his piano music is exceptional. Um, and I think the, the only thing that I would say about the, the bigger or more orchestral pieces is that um, he just needed, he needed more time to work on it. He needed a little bit of pushback from, from a mentor to say, um, not this, but this, or more this, less this, um, you know, the kinds of things I hear my colleagues say to our students all the time. Um, and he didn't have that. He didn't have that pushback. He very much composed in a, in a vacuum. And if you know, um, you know, if we know anything about Burgess, he, he did not lack for ideas. So, you know, if let, you know, if we let him run free, <laughs> you know, there's, there's going to be too many ideas, you know, so, um, so I think that uh, the bigger stuff tends to be a little too big, and the smaller stuff tends to be the more heartfelt, uh, better constructed. And as I said, my, I love those preludes and fugues. I think they're, I think they're absolutely gorgeous and, um, really show, I think the pinnacle of his art as a composer. Well, that's, that's a really fascinating critique of Burgess's music. And, uh, and I, it strikes me as you were speaking, Christine, that a lot of that could easily be applied to no, a number of his novels. Um, you know, if we we're thinking about the scale of them, the ambition of them, you know, some of their excesses, perhaps, and also the the, uh, the fact that Burgess himself w- would write often really without an editor. You know, he's, he's writing these things, and there's, uh, he gets very little feedback except um, except after they emerge into the world. Um, what you have to say about Burgess's piano music, then, I think, is particularly fascinating, and it and it's certainly true that there's been more and more interest in that. Uh, part of his output in in recent years, um, also indeed in the, in the chamber works more generally the works for you know, five or six players, and it's our hope here at the Burgess Foundation that more and more of that music will find its way into the world. Well, thanks very much, Christine. That was all uh, fantastic to listen to, and congratulations again on a wonderful edition of this man in music. This is part of the Irwell edition of Anthony Burgess's works. Um, more and more of which are appearing. I think this is perhaps the fifth in the series and we're delighted to have it. So congratulations. Thank you so much for having me on. You have been listening to the International Anthony Burgess Foundation podcast. Christine Lee Gengaro's edition of This Man and Music is out now. Stefan Ginsberg's interpretation of Burgess's piano music, the bad-tempered electronic keyboard, is available to buy, stream, and download. For more information on Burgess and the Orwell edition, visit www.anthonyburgess.org.